be me, playing my second ever adventure in Call of Cthulhu. Setting is Massachusetts set vaguely in the 1890s to 1920s range because default. First character had been Tatiana, the Russian prima ballerina, thought that with my beauty and knowledge of the arts I would be the party face. Somehow ended up spending the whole adventure drop kicking everyone and everything as the party muscle. Apparently putting a bunch of points into kick, jump, and dodge means I'm basically a martial arts master in point shoes. Hilarious. But I wanted my next adventure to have a bit more investigation and occult interaction. Enter Dr. Cosmo, former professor of astronomy at Miskatonic University. Former professor due to unprofessional behavior and implanting ridiculous stories into the heads of students. You see, Dr. Cosmo will be quick to tell you he was abducted by aliens. Now, these aren't the usual Lovecraft aliens like Migo or Shoggoths. The aliens Dr. Cosmo describes are pretty much your standard Roswell Greys, albeit more than 30 years early to the trend. So yes, I'm now playing a UFO conspiracy theorist in a Lovecraft setting. I left it completely up to the GM how much truth or delusion my story contained. Either way, I was now living in a small countryside cabin on forced sabbatical. The adventure opens with Dr. Cosmo in his backyard, where he has constructed 150 scale model of Stonehenge. After sacrificing a chicken, I am disappointed to find the mothership has not taken my invitation to land. Of course Dr. Cosmo is a man of science, so he didn't really believe the chicken murder was of any practical purpose, but it just seemed like it fit with the theme. Keep in mind that Dr. Cosmo has no actual points in occult knowledge, he is just an astronomer with the high intelligence and education stats you'd expect. Although I did roll near the maximum for his power stat, which determines not just your chance to successfully use magic but also the starting amount of sanity points. This last bit is the only reason I managed to live long enough to do any of this shit. Deciding a goat might make a better offering, I head down to the town general store to inquire about livestock for sale. The store owner asks me what I'm doing and I proudly announce that I am attempting to contact my brothers among the stars. One of Dr. Cosmo's traits is that he is super friendly, direct, and honest. Even if that means he would wander into obviously dangerous situations or spout things that should get him committed. Surprisingly, the owner nods sagely and my ramblings and says that he totally knows some guys doing the same thing and might be able to help me out. Of course I ask to meet them, and I'm led down a trap door in the back of the shop into a sprawling underground cavern system beneath the town. We've been playing 5 minutes and I've tripped into the main plot before even getting a chance to meet the other investigators. Apparently the easiest way to find your local eldritch cult is to sound like a crazy person. Within a massive chamber, men in robes busy themselves constructing an elaborate arcane ritual circle on the cave floor. The leader of the group comes forward and raises a crooked finger at me. Who comes into the sanctum of the children of the unspeakable seeking boons from our great master art? Hi I'm Dr. Cosmo and I was told that you knew how to contact our alien brethren among the stars. They visited me once and I'd like to see them again. Fool we can do more than that. For here in our very lair we host banished denizens of the great beyond gusp dodgif. The cult leader is a little put off by the eagerness but agrees to take me to meet his aliens. Many hints are dropped that this dude is just taking the professor to get munched on but I am fanboying far too hard to notice. Cult leader takes me down into the grotto of horror storm. Waiting is a trio of massive gorilla like monsters with split open faces. I am initially disappointed that these aren't Grey Senpei. I am also taking a bit of sanity damage just by looking at them. Still, I firmly believe in fostering brotherhood and friendship with our extraterrestrial neighbors. I walk up to hulking monsters gnawing on the bones of their last victims and cheerfully introduce myself. The gugs are perplexed as their usual response from humans is horrified shrieking. In guttural, broken English they ask what I want more sanity damage. I tell them I come in peace and wish to interview them to find out everything I can about space travel so I can find my grey friends. Because just knowing these things exist hurts my head, so clearly I should ask them about the history of their entire civilization. They even offer to mind meld with me to remove that pesky language barrier so I can get all that sweet eldritch horror directly into my brain. I even make sure to ask about their religion so I can get the rundown on at least 4 elder gods just to really make sure I go comatose. 
But Dr. Cosmo hasn't failed a sanity save yet and he doesn't start now. I thank my new friends for the interview and head back to the cult chamber with a modest loss in sanity but a huge increase in Mike Thalhumithar's skill. By this point the consensus at the table is that Dr. Cosmo hasn't gone insane because everything he's learning has for the most part lined up with what he actually believes. It helps that the likelihood of making a sanity save is tied directly to how much you have, so even with the attrition I've only gone from a 90% chance of success to something like 75%. When the cult leader sees me return alive and unharmed, he decides perhaps this weird astronomer might be useful. He offers me a deal that if I help out with their summoning circle, he'd provide me the means to travel into space. I gladly accept and am handed a massive grimoire of forbidden knowledge, which of course deals sanity damage just by looking at the cover. I flip to chapters in i.e. the stars are right, how to use the celestial forces to attract that special some being. After reading the thing for 12 straight hours, the cult leader is now having a minor freak out you see, the usual procedure to have cultists take our long shifts reading a single page and contributes what they learned to the ritual. This is because anyone left reading the thing for too long starts having their eyeballs liquefy from sheer madness. With another successful sanity roll, I emerge from my trance and hand them a diagram that basically tells them everything they need to complete the ritual and summon their unholy master. I'm waiting for the GM to give me a reason for Dr. Cosmo to want to turn against the cult so I can join the party but it's just not happening. The cult leader has basically tried to off me twice but I keep surviving while also profiting in some way. By this point the cult leader is about 50 stroke 50 on whether he wants to try to recruit me for real or get me as far away from his operation as possible. The coin flip lands on Gfo so I'm given another sanity draining book to study. This one containing the two spells that will allow me to traverse space safely. The first will allow me to brew space mead, the elixir that allows one to survive the cold horror of the void. The second will let me summon a space horse. Okay it's actually called a Bayakhi but that's less fun. Also, using magic drains your sanity, because at this point the whole table is just waiting to see how long I can run with this nonsense before it all comes tumbling down. We're sitting on about a 50% full sanity meter but Dr. Cosmo just can't be stopped. I successfully learn both spells and cast them in front of the whole cult who are starting to think I'm some manner of prophet by this point. I take a swig of mead, hop onto my weird bat monster, bid my adoring public farewell, and rocket up towards the cavern ceiling at escape velocity. My stead phases us into the ghost dimension or some shit and we rocket into the forbidding gap between worlds. Where did it reddit.jpg? I have no idea how to steer this thing. Which is good because the GM has no idea what to do with my character at this point either. Wanna know what the rest of the party was doing me too, because I was mostly in the other room while they were playing to avoid metagaming. They stuck around while Dr. Cosmo had the spotlight because we all thought he was going to drop dead at any moment. At the point where it looked like I was legitimately going to become a warlock and into space. I was allowed to follow the rest of the action. Turns out the other two players were a grizzled detective and police officer who were exploring a different section of those underground caverns. They'd figured out that the cult down here worshipped Hasta, something I was oblivious to despite working for them. The GM wanted to use Hasta for the big threat since he's actually a pretty nice guy who helps out his cultists. This is apparently why they entered a crypt and found the actual goddamn king in yellow just hanging out. What is basically Hasta's avatar is just sitting in some cave underneath a random town in Massachusetts. Of course, our intrepid duo whip out their guns and fire at it while screaming in terror. If you thought I was hogging all the good rolls from my group, you'd be wrong. Because when our police officer got a crit at point blank range, we all learned that shotguns in Call of Cthulhu are fucking busted. 4d6 damage twice around to something with 60 hit points and no armor meant they actually dealt enough damage to force the king to demanifest in the second round. Granted that one round let the king give them several broken limbs and a splitting headache but that's probably on equal footing to the bullshit I was up to. Of course, this is still Call of Cthulhu. So when the detective was trying to climb his way back to the surface with his broken arm, he failed his climb roll, lost his grip, tumbled down 20 feet and died on impact. And that was how we ended the first session. For the second session, 
We decided to start by following Dr. Cosmo's space adventures until his stupid luck ran out and he finally died. The GM told me he had just given up trying to make anything akin to a plot for me. To be fair, I'd gone off the reservation and the rest of the party was dismantling his intrigue with liberal application of buckshot. I don't begrudge him just wanting to tie up loose ends and move on to a new game. Since I was careening through the void on a space horse I could barely control. We were going full random now. Basically, the velocity involved in each trip knocks me unconscious so I more or less wake up somewhere vaguely in the direction I was aiming towards. Or maybe I brewed a little too much actual mead in my space mead, who knows. I'd roll a d100, and the GM would flip to that entry in the creatures section of the manual to figure out what I ran into. Which meant I could find anything between my neighbor's dog to the elder god's poker night. First roll was something like 82, which took me to an alien planet covered in shifting sands and the ruins of a great race that once lived here. After walking around a bit, I was accosted by a local ghost who demanded I leave these sacred ruins and stop disturbing the dead. Being the polite fellow that I am, I got back on my horse and left. I mean, it's his home, I'm not going to intrude. Still alive so we roll again and I get somewhere in the 50s range. So after our warp jump I wake up in a random field in Ireland. I am rather put out by this, and my complaining about still being on earth causes a small rat-like creature with a human face to pop out of a nearby hole. After some conversation it turns out this guy is some manner of wizard, and I ask him if I could learn his size changing spell. He performs the spell, and then manages to fail his own sanity save and now a giant sized rat leprechaun attempting to wage a one man war against the local trees for stealing his porridge. Deciding I've gotten everything I can from this encounter, I get back on my space horse and try to get off planet again. This time I roll a 12, and the GM's eyes go wide. When I wake up, I am lying in the midst of a great city encapsulated by a large air bubble underneath a massive ocean above. The architecture is unfamiliar, bending in angles that seem impossible to the eyes. It doesn't take much exploring before I come to a statue of some grotesque monster with the head of a squid and bat wings upon its back. I read the words on the statue's plinth. Well if I didn't manage to roll my way into finding the goddamn star of the show. So of course I march myself right up to the big guy's sleeping chamber so I can ask for directions to Zeta Reticuli. And here, when I am finally confronted with the full splendor of a sleeping great old one, my luck finally runs out. My 90 starting sanity had been whittled into something like 37 by this point and this was justifiably the hardest roll I'd had. I failed, and lost something like 80 sanity. Drowning in madness upon beating a being greater than even the greys I had been searching for. We close on the scene of Dr. Cosmo pledging to awaken his new master so the whole world might ascend to join our cosmic brothers among the stars. But that wasn't the end. The rest of the group got to have their adventure after my sideshow wrapped up. I declined to make a new character to join them largely because I felt I'd already eaten enough playtime with my shenanigans. The short version is that the police officer managed to round up a vigilante posse and raid a National Guard arsenal for weapons. Personally I thought the ease with which that was accomplished was a little unrealistic but I'm hardly one to talk. After some back and forth the officer's player managed to convince the GM that it was totally reasonable for there to be Gatling gun and the armory left over from the Civil War. Kitted up for war, the party led a full on shootout against Haster's cult in caverns. It really does feel like I was playing Lovecraft Mad Libs while the rest of the party went full Delta Green. I complained about shotguns last time but that's because they are hilariously powerful for how easy they are to acquire. A Gatling gun, which I was surprised the book even has stats for, was clearly intended never to be in player hands because dear lord. He who is not to be named barely put a tentacle through the portal before there were dozens of .58 rounds in his robbery hide. We can add, short off Haster's nose with a rotary gun to the list of things we should not have been allowed to get away with. As the cultists were mowed down and the ritual started the fail, the magical backlash caused the whole cavern to start collapsing. Most of the NPC cannon fodder brought in for the fight died in the cave and but the party barely managed to make it out. Thoroughly enraged, Haster used his remaining seconds on our world to make a summoning of his own. His cult may have been destroyed. 
but he had learned of a being that could pose a greater threat to this world than. Cut to Dr. Cosmo, who in a flash of light finds himself back in rural Massachusetts. As I wander back towards town I find a National Guard barricade on the road. As always, I ignore any chance for subtlety and cheerfully greet the armed men as I walk past. They immediately detain me and ask why I am trying to walk into a small war zone. Oh, I'm just looking for some friends of mine. They wear robes and like to hang out in caves. They helped me go into space and I've got fantastic news to share with them. I receive blank stares while the GM rolls something behind the screen, then throws up his hands. The soldier smile and flash rings bearing Haster's symbol. Turns out there was a 10% chance of these guys being cultists. I am briefed on the situation and the cultists look to Dr. Cosmo for guidance. Gentlemen, this is a sad day. Our brothers among the stars have offered their tentacles and pseudopods in friendship and we have responded with fear and violence. Humanity will never be a part of the great galactic family until we as a species change our way of thinking. And I know just the guy for the job and so I left with the beginnings of my very own cult to find a means to raise the sunken city of Adi and awaken great Cthulhu from his slumber. So ended our adventure. I like to think Dr. Cosmo is still out there, looking to plunge the world into unending madness with the power of friendship. Despite setting up Dr. Cosmo to be the new big threat, we didn't continue the game any further. Years later I would pick up Call of Cthulhu for a third adventure, this time with myself as the Grams. It proceeded to spiral out of control just as quickly as this one. It probably didn't help that the first threat the party had to defeat was an evil salad bar. I think I might be the reason I can never seem to play a normal adventure with this game. Today's lesson. Praise Cthulhu. So yeah, this is another one from Kuma9. You guys loved his chess game story. I thought it was really good, so I had to do a bit of digging and see what else he's got. And I have to say, this is the best Call of Cthulhu story I've done since Bonzo the Sad Crown. If you haven't given that one a go yet, I did it a while back. Um, I'll throw it in the cards at the end. Um, also, again, thank you to PMP. Or, sorry, how to PMP. He has a YouTube channel. Um, it's about D&D &D and stuff, but sadly it seems to be all in German, so uh, I can't really say much, but I'll put his links in the description as well. Um, look, as always, thanks for watching, remember to subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video. So I've recently moved Nick Badia merch over to Teesprings and have a few new designs. Listings are below the video and in the description. Just stop! Just stop it! Stop! No, it's just stop it. It's time to stop. It's time to stop, okay? No more. Where the fuck are your parents? Who are your parents? I'm gonna call Child Protective Services. It's time to stop.